Eliminator Time Force, Part 1 Chapter 1 Look, man, I don't care what you have to do. Either get me the stuff you owe me, or you are going to end up the same way Marco did. Kevin Hauser sneered into his burner phone. I... I can get it to you on Monday. Yeah, Monday. I just need a little more time. The frightened voice on the other end stuttered. Kevin resisted the urge to throw the phone onto the dash of his 1987 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. He had spent years and an ungodly amount of money retrofitting the classic from the ground up. Spinner rims, ground effects, and a fresh coat of jet black paint would have made the car stand out in the best neighborhoods, let alone on Kevin Street, which had more bars on the windows than the prison he spent eight months in for assault. You are really trying my patience, man. I don't like it when people waste my time. And I guarantee. Damn. T, you aren't going to like me when I lose my patience. Kevin said forcefully as he slowly pulled into his driveway. The anger in his voice resonated through the quiet street, causing his next-door neighbor to draw the blind shut. Okay, I hear you, sir. And I promise. Save your promises for someone who will believe them, he replied, cutting the man off. Kevin paused before launching into one more fear-inducing tirade when he noticed the front door to his house was wide open. The phone dropped from his ear as the voice on the other end began yammering on empty platitudes. Incompetence angered Kevin, but paled in comparison to someone breaking into his home. He squeezed the cheap phone so tightly that audible cracks reverberated through the night air. Whatever, man. Just get it done or pay the price. Kevin tossed the phone into the passenger seat before reaching into the center console for his butterfly knife. The powder blue handled blade was a gift from his mother after he was released from prison. In his line of work, he needed protection, but carrying a gun was a risky prospect for someone with a parole officer who had an annoying habit of being thorough with the checkups. He approached the door cautiously, juggling open the blade as he composed himself. Kevin tried to assess the situation by peering through the curtains. There was a lamp illuminated in the front corner of the living room, highlighting the silhouette of someone sitting on the couch by the window. After a short pause on the porch, Kevin burst into the front room blade first, letting out a battle cry in the process. He stomped through the middle of the room, pausing at the doorway to the kitchen before turning to face the trespasser. Kevin pointed the knife towards the floor when he saw a young woman in her early 20s sitting on the couch, reading a magazine with one hand and drinking a beer with the other. Artemis looked like any one of a thousand other girls that might be found in a college town. Her athletic build fit her 5-foot, 6-inch frame well and made it pretty evident she was familiar with CrossFit. The shoulder-length brown hair pulled into a ponytail showed she was more concerned with functionality rather than appearance. Her Iron Maiden Caught Somewhere in Time t-shirt, however, alerted the world she did in fact have great taste in music. Who the fuck are you? Kevin asked with a mixture of bemusement and anger. Artemis kept her head down and continued to read her magazine, holding up her beer hand and a nonverbal hold on. Are you kidding me right now? Kevin screeched, the amusement gone from his voice. You have to the count of five before I slice you up. Artemis closed her magazine and gently set it beside her. One. Kevin spoke softly. My apologies. That was rude of me, Artemis said, still not making eye contact with Kevin. Two. His voice rose ever so slightly. It was a great article on Bruce Dickinson and how he's a certified airline pilot. Three. He spit out, cracking his neck in preparation for the assault. Imagine being that famous. Touring eight months out of the year, and the way you relax is flying jumbo jets with hundreds of passengers, she said, before taking a long sip of beer. Simply amazing. Four, he raged, spittle flying off his bottom lip. You know, you may want to think long and hard about your next word, Artemis said confidently as she finishes off the beer. You may not like what happens when you get there. Five. Kevin screamed before lunging at Artemis. Kevin took a single step before Artemis's beer hit him in the face, momentarily stunning him. Before he could recover, she had leapt off the couch and disarmed him, 
by grabbing his wrist with one hand and delivering a powerful uppercut to his elbow with the other. Kevin stumbled backwards and emitted a high-pitched yelp in an octave typically audible only to dogs. Artemis was unsure if it was due to the pain or the sight of his bone sticking out from underneath the skin. Ah. Uh, I, I'm gonna kill you, Kevin threatened impotently. Artemis swooped down to pick up the fallen blade. She flipped it around a couple times with her left hand like a seasoned pro, while using her right to taunt him with a come-here wave, her sly smile letting Kevin know he had met his match. He let out a yell and swung hard with a straight jab. Artemis met his punch with the business end of the blade, embedding it deep within his fist. Kevin staggered away from her, unable to vocalize his pain. He stumbled about for a moment before regaining his footing, just in time to see her quickly moving in for the kill. Artemis took two steps before launching herself knee-first into his chest. The force of the blow sent Kevin flying backwards to the ground. Before he could figure out what happened, Artemis was straddling his chest, knees pressed down on his biceps. Told you that you should have thought about your next word, she said as she tapped him on the forehead. Kevin tried in vain to swing at her with his knife hand. On the second attempt, Artemis grabbed his wrist and pulled the blade out, sending a spatter of blood onto the wall. He continued to flail his arms until the tip of the blade was pressed up against his jugular. Easy now, honey. Let's talk about this, Kevin begged. Oh, so now you want to talk. What? No more counting? Nope. No more counting. Kevin said as he shook his head side to side. Look, if you want the stash, it's under a false bottom in the cabinet beside the stove. Don't care about your stash, she said, digging the knife ever so slightly into his neck. However, I do care about the keepsakes from the three women you've already murdered that you hide alongside your stash, not to mention the four other women you have on your hit list. Kevin let out a bit of a laugh. What in the world are you talking about? I never... Artemis interrupted his denial by smashing the bridge of his nose with the butt end of the knife handle. Believe me when I say that I'm the last person you would ever be able to lie to. She said while digging the knife a little deeper into his skin. I'm telling you, you have the wrong person, he pleaded. Marcy Davis, Elaine Woodman, Lay Smith. Kevin's face drained of all of its remaining color upon hearing those names. Names nobody should have been able to connect to him. You stalked all three of them for weeks before following them home from their bartender jobs on 6th Street. Once they crashed out from a long night slinging drinks, you broke into their homes, raped them, then slit their throats and gleefully watched as they bled out. But you weren't finished. Rather than let them die with dignity, you packed them into the trunk of their car and drove them out to Grant State Park. Once there, you dumped the bodies in a secluded area known for its high concentration of feral hogs which I have to admit is a great way to dispose of a corpse. Frankly, I'm shocked that someone of your limited mental capacity could come up with an idea like that on your own. All right, so you think you know some things Kevin said with a hint of unexpected confidence in his voice. But I know for a fact you ain't got no proof. Because if you did, this place would be swarming with cops, and I don't see no blue lights. Wait, you think I'm a cop? Artemis amusingly asked. It's either that, or you are with some rival gang, trying to blackmail me to get in on my territory. In which case, all they had to do was send your fine ass over, as a peace offering. I would have been happy to share. Wow, you sound really cocky for a man with no functioning hands and a knife to his throat. Artemis said, bewildered at his attitude. Are you really such a deluded alpha male that you don't realize your life is about to end? Oh, give me a break. Yeah, you fucked me up pretty good. But I know lots of bitches like you that will throw down. We both know you ain't got the balls to, Kevin said, before being cut short by Artemis driving the knife deep into his neck. She pulled the knife out, leaving it on the floor beside him. His eyes filled with dread as the realization of his fate sunk in. As he continued to bleed out, Artemis walked into the kitchen. The last sound Kevin heard was the satisfying seesh of a bottle cap being removed from a cold beer. Artemis rejoined him in the living room just as he went limp. All right, time to get to work, 
she said before kneeling down and ripping off his shirt. She reached into her back pocket and pulled out a silver LED laser with a blue tip. You know you're lucky I'm rusty, or else I would have left you alive for this. But legibility is more important than your suffering, she said before turning the laser on. The beam is a lot more powerful than what normally is emitted, and the sound of burning flesh fills the room. Artemis makes a few hand motions with the device, before pausing for a sip of beer. She takes a moment to admire her work. Well, not bad for freehand, she tells herself, before putting the beer down and continuing her work. Chapter 2 Artemis opened the door of her one-room apartment and slumped inside. While it had been a satisfying day of work, it had taken its toll on her. She made her way past the makeshift cot on the floor and over to a small desk that was buried in papers, electronic parts, and a laptop that had been outdated since the turn of the century. It took her a moment of searching before she was able to locate a black dry erase marker. To an outside observer, the wall beside her desk was reminiscent of a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist's wall depicting his latest attempt to connect Elvis to the JFK assassination. Maps, surveillance photos, and bits of string interconnecting them all, covering virtually all of the space. The only exceptions were three dry erase boards hung in the corner just above the desk. Artemis licked her thumb and reached over to a small whiteboard marked saved erasing a number three and replacing it with a seven. She took a moment to admire the new count of 16,247. She continued her self-congratulation on the next board, marked Most Wanted, by drawing a large black line through the name Kevin Hauser, who'd been a new entry on the board at position 10. He joined several other names who had been marked off in recent weeks, but not Anthony Duke, who was at the very top and written twice as large as anybody else. She shook her head in frustration before taking a seat and opening the computer. The laptop took a moment to boot up, giving Artemis a brief reprieve from the world. The moment was a fleeting one, as the screen greeted her with a bright red alert notification. These alerts used to be a rare occurrence, but in the past six months, they had picked up at an alarming rate. Reluctantly, she clicked the button and a news article popped up. Child, age 11 found strangled in woods behind family home, read the headline. Artemis quickly scrolled through the story until she found the name of the kid, Benjamin Kimball. As she had feared, it matched a name on the third board, labeled Prez. There were a list of names and numbers, starting at 48 and going through 60, five of which had already been marked out. Son of a bitch. Reluctantly, she grabbed the marker and scratched out number 58, Benjamin Kimball. Upon replacing the cap, she threw it against the desk where it landed with a soft thud on the reams of paper. Artemis slumped down in her chair for a moment before picking up her cell phone. Robert, it's Artemis. Well, this can't be good, a booming male voice stated. You never just call to say hello. Number 58 just went down. Child strangled in the woods behind his house. You think it's the Duke again? Robert inquired. It matches his M.O., so it has to be. It's also the third future president that's been murdered in the last six weeks in the exact same way. That can't be a coincidence. No, it can't be. You still think he's working with one of ours. It's the only way to explain it, but it still doesn't entirely make sense, Artemis said in a frustrated manner. If he was working with one of ours, then why would he only be taking out the initial presidents while leaving their replacements alone? Who knows? Maybe they have damaged equipment and aren't getting updates. Or maybe they are just bored and want to remix the future. You know, get some different war movies and TV shows out of it, Robert said in a lighthearted tone. Artemis let out a small laugh at the suggestion. While I hope that's the case... I get the sense their motives are a bit more nefarious. I agree wholeheartedly. So have you made contact with the agent yet? Left the message for him tonight. If all goes as planned, we'll be having breakfast at your place in the morning, Artemis replied. Just for the record, I'm still not completely sold on this plan. I understand Robert, but desperate times, 
call for desperate measures. You're right, he reluctantly replied. Thanks, Robert. I'll see you in the morning. I'll be ready. Artemis tossed the phone onto the pile of papers on her desk and stared at the news article on her screen. I'm going to get this bastard, she said before slamming the screen down. Chapter 3 A fleet of police vehicles had congregated outside the late Kevin Hauser's house. Blue lights illuminated the neighborhood, which was something of a regular occurrence in these parts. So regular that not a single neighbor left the comfort of their home to investigate. This made it a lot easier for Special Agent Hodge to get to the heart of the crime scene. Hodge was a seasoned vet of the force and one of the few plainclothes officers in his precinct. He walked up to the front door with the swagger of an officer of the law. His faded jeans and untucked button-down shirt, however, made him more suited to be pulling up a stool in a dive bar than investigating a murder. Hey, this is a crime scene, pal. You can't be in here, the officer by the door yelled as Hodge approached. I'm Special Agent Hodge, he replied, flashing his badge in the process. Really, you're Hodge, the officer asked. You don't look like much of a cop. Well, I am. They gave me a badge in everything. Even let me carry a gun. But then again, this is Texas. So I guess that part doesn't make me so special, Hodge replied sarcastically. The officer shook his head in disgust. You know, my mother always said it's important to take pride in the way one looks. Well, your mother was a smart woman, Hodge said in an upbeat tone. She knew you were an ugly child and couldn't withstand any other outward-facing flaws if you were ever going to see a naked woman without paying a cover charge first. The officer was taken aback by the verbal assault. Now, are you going to tell me why I got called into this? Or would you like to continue discussing your mother's fashion tips? The officer squinted his eyes in displeasure before pointing towards the kitchen door. Dead guy over there has your name written all over it. Hodge walked over to Kevin's body, momentarily pausing when he noticed the condition of it. Well, he wasn't wrong. He said to himself before kneeling down to get a closer look at Kevin's chest. The words, Special Agent Hodge, has been burned into his upper torso, and a small arrow pointed down towards a USB, stick resting on his stomach. Agent Hodge took a plastic glove from his pocket and put it on before carefully picking up the USB stick to inspect it. Somebody get me a laptop. Chapter 4. The officer dropped the laptop onto the table in front of Hodge, still smarting from his previous conversation with him. Anything else, Special Agent Hodge, said the officer, dripping with resentment. Yeah, how about some coffee, Hodge replied in an upbeat tone. I'll send your server right out, replied the officer as he took a step back from the table. Hodge inspected the USB drive as the computer booted up. He had seen a lot of odd things during his tenure on the force. But this was a new one. All right, let's see what we got, he said as he plugged in the drive. The desktop vanished, leaving on a black screen and a single line of white text that read what name did your dad originally want for you. A blinking cursor awaited his answer. What the hell kind of question is that? The officer asked, peering over Hodge's shoulder. It's a question that nobody should know the answer to outside of me and my father. So the killer is working with your father? Only if they are psychic. My father has been dead for 20 years. Your mother? 10 years, Hodge replied. He leaned back in his chair, stretching his hands out behind his head. No. This. This is something else. He contemplated for a moment before taking his position a keyboard. He carefully typed out Francis and hit enter. The black screen faded away to reveal a secondary desktop page. The gray gradient background was broken up by a single video file. In the middle of the screen, the file name read for Special Agent Hodge only. I'm going to need some privacy, Hodge stated, motioning for the officer to leave. Once the room was clear, he double-clicked the icon and the video began to play. Artemis is on the screen sitting inside her apartment, albeit in silhouette form, to protect her identity. Special Agent Hodge, I realize that this isn't the ideal way for us to meet, but I figured it would be the only way for you to take me seriously. I have information regarding the mass murderer Anthony Duke that would be beneficial to your investigation. 
Hodge nearly leapt out of his chair when the name Anthony Duke was spoken. He had always been focused on Duke as the main suspect in those killings, but could never collect enough hard evidence to prove it. While he was 100% convinced Duke was behind the murders, he never volunteered the name to anyone else in his department for fear of being kicked off the case. Hodge hit pause on the video as he ran through every scenario he could come up with as to how this woman knew that name. Did someone hack his computer? Break into his office? Been stalking him? It took a moment for him to snap out his panicked, deep thought. After a deep breath, he hit play again. I will be at Tate's bar tomorrow at 9 a.m. Ask for Artemis and the bartender will point you in the right direction. If you bring back up, I will be gone before you walk through the front door, and you will never get the information that I have. I look forward to meeting with you face to face. She stated before leaning forward to turn off the camera, stopping just short of doing so. Oh, and one more thing about our friend in the next room. His name is Kevin Hauser. He is responsible for the rape and murders of Marcy Davis, Elaine Woodman, and Lay Smith. Chances are all three of them are in your missing persons database as their bodies haven't been found yet. You might want to send a team over to Grant State Park to start looking. Have them concentrate on the areas where feral hogs congregate. His prints should match those found in all three of their apartments as well. And if that's not enough to convince you, take a peek under the false bottom in the cabinet beside the stove. You're welcome, Artemis said before leaning forward to grab the camera, ending the video. Hodge closed the laptop and took a deep breath before pulling out the USB key and pocketing it. He looked at the cabinet beside the stove, noticing that it didn't appear to have been disturbed by the officers. Hey, any of your men gone through the cabinets in here? Hodge yelled to the officer in the other room. Nope. We just cleared the premises for potential hostels, then waited for you to get here, the officer replied. Hodge moseyed over to the cabinet and opened the door. He reached in and touched the bottom, freeing up the loose board and causing it to fall. It had a soft landing on a gallon freezer bag of blue meth that had been pre-packaged into individual fun size portions. Another small bag was found underneath it, containing three locks of hair. Each lock had a small label on them with the first name of the girls mentioned in the video. While Hodge was relieved that another madman was off the streets, he couldn't help but to feel uneasy about the mystery woman and everything she knew. Hey, officer, are you on with dispatch? Yeah, what do you need? I need three names run through missing persons. Marcy Davis, Elaine Woodman, and Lay Smith. Got it, the officer said before stepping to the other room to run the names. Hodge leaned against the cabinets and continued to look at the locks of hair. His mind continued to race in a futile attempt to process the last few minutes. This guy wasn't even on our radar, but somehow she not only knew about it, but took him out. He thought, maybe she actually does know something about Duke. Got the info on those girls, the officer stated, as he came back into the kitchen. All three of them were reported missing over the last four months. Hodge contemplated for a moment before handing the bag of hair over. Officer, how would you like to have your picture in the paper tomorrow? What do you mean? Well, I'm pretty sure these locks of hair match the three girls you just asked dispatch about. And I'm also pretty sure that the asshole in there is the reason they are on the missing persons list, Hodge said as he tossed the bag to the officer. What? Wait, this is your case, the officer protested knowing the mountain of paperwork that would be involved. And I'm handing it over to you. I'm following up a much larger lead on a different case that takes priority. But, but you can't. Relax, buddy. Couple quick bits of advice. Never give the press details they don't need to know. Always let the cutest reporter ask the first question and make sure you do your mother proud by taking her advice to heart and dressing up in something classy. Hodge rattled off as he walked by the bewildered officer, slapping him on the shoulder as he went. Oh, and one more thing. Pretty sure the girls are in Grant State Park hanging with some feral hogs. You might not want to dress up for that part. Hodge exited the house, pausing to take a breath in the cool night air. There was so much to process that it was impossible to pick a place to begin. He had a thousand questions and zero answers, at least none that made any sense. For now, all he could do was hurry up and wait. Chapter 5 
Tate's Bar was an Austin Southside legend, first opening its doors in January of 1971. Throughout the years, every up-and-coming hard rock, punk, and metal band imaginable has graced the 8x10 stage, tucked away at the back of the venue, leaving their band's signature on the wall before departing. Four decades later, a patron can relive the entire musical history of the building, just by reading the names that have been left on every exposed surface. While considered a treat to die hard music fans, the residents of the nearby multi-million dollar condos were less impressed. Hodge pulled open the ancient wooden front door, exposing the grime from the previous evening's show to an unhealthy dose of sunlight. Before his eyes could adjust to the dimly lit room, a deep voice bellowed out from behind the bar. Morning. Hodge rubbed his eyes to accelerate the adjustment period. Eventually, they were able to focus on a burly six-foot-two man standing behind the bar. Morning, he said as he walked towards him, sitting on the corner stool. The bartender set out a surprisingly clean shot glass and poured some low-level whiskey right to the brim. Hodge studied the glass for a moment, then looked the man right in the eye. Dude, it's nine in the morning, he said in a mystified tone. The man sighed while turning to the counter behind him for a coffee pot and mug. He stopped to pour two-thirds of the way up before grabbing the whiskey and dumping it in. Hodge gave the cup another look before grabbing it. Thank you. That's more like it. I aim to please, the man replied. I'm looking for Artemis. Thank you for coming Special Agent Hodge, Artemis said as she emerged from the back hallway. Hodge casually stood up from the bar and walked towards Artemis, seemingly more concerned with his coffee than the threat she might pose to him. You aren't what I expected, he said. I bet you hear that a lot yourself, she replied. Hodge nodded in agreement as they both approached a table. Please, have a seat. We have a lot to discuss. That we do. I mean, you killed a man and carved a message into his chest just to get my attention. So obviously I have a question or two for you. Technically, I burned a message into his chest. Carving is just too messy. Artemis replied in a playful tone. Touché, Hodge replied. So, what would you like to know? Well, why don't we start at the top? Who are you? Hodge replied, taking a sip of coffee. That's a bit of a loaded question. Do you want the short version or the long one? Well, I have a full cup of coffee, and I'm in no hurry to get into the office, so might as well make it the long version. Okay, my name is Artemis. I traveled back in time in order to make America a superpower and save it from a dystopian fate. After succeeding in that mission, I started using my power and knowledge so that I could make the world a better place by taking out murderers before they are able to do harm. I reached out to you because I need your help in bringing down Anthony Duke, who I suspect is working with one of my former associates and is a threat to the future security of the nation and the world. Hodge stared blankly at her for a moment before reaching down for his coffee cup. He rotated the cup a couple of times giving him an opportunity to process everything that was just thrown at him. Hodge let out a deep sigh before taking a sip of coffee. Okay. I admit, I'm intrigued. I tell you what. I like a good sci-fi story as much as the next guy. How about you tell me about your dystopian future and how you managed to travel through time to save America while I finish my coffee? After that, we'll go on a ride and I'll introduce you to some very nice people who will take great interest in what you have to say. They'll even give you a nice, comfy room free of charge. Good to see that you have an open mind Special Agent Hodge. Yeah, let's go with that, he replied skeptically. The America I come from is very different than the one that exists in your timeline. At this point in my history, America only had around 80 million people, and most of them were on the verge of starvation. Thanks to the global nuclear winter, the majority of the crops were permanently destroyed. The only options for food were limited supplies that could be grown in greenhouses and underground, which wasn't a whole lot. Nuclear winter? Hodge asked as he leaned forward to take a sip of his coffee. What? Did the Cold War turn out differently? Kennedy screw up the Cuban Missile Crisis. There wasn't a Cold War, at least not one with us involved. 
World War II was much more devastating for us. Germany was led by a competent military commander who was able to conquer Western Europe and who was also smart enough to take out the Brits. Without England as a launching pad, there wasn't a D-Day. So America never entered the European front of the war. To make matters worse, the Nazis were able to completely control the Atlantic with their U-boats and captured Royal Navy ships. In order to protect our shores from invasion, we had to devote most of our ships to the east. The lack of firepower in the Pacific meant that after Pearl Harbor, we essentially battled Japan to a stalemate. So Germany never invaded Russia? Nope. The military leaders were smart enough to know they'd never be able to survive a Russian winter with the military machinery they had. So they solidified the lines right through the middle of Poland and both sides spent the next 25 years engaging in an unprecedented military buildup. There were numerous small-level skirmishes in disputed territories, as well as a couple of proxy wars around the globe. But nothing major until 1982. A high-level German government official was visiting a shared port town in northern Poland, where he was murdered by a drunk Russian soldier during a bar altercation. German leaders considered this an assassination. The Russians tried to appease them by doing a two-day Foch trial of the soldier resulting in his conviction and execution. But it was too late. Hardliners in the German government were able to convince the chancellor that action had to be taken. By the end of the week, there was a full-scale ground war involving millions of troops on both sides. Details are spotty after that, but we do know that six months into the conflict, the nukes started flying. In a matter of hours, dozens of cities and hundreds of millions of lives were snuffed out in an instant. Hodge released his coffee mug long enough to do a light-hearted golf clap. Well, bravo for preventing nuclear annihilation. But I still can't help but think you and your team did a rather poor job, given that Hitler still came to power. Are you kidding me? Artemis stated forcefully, slamming her hands to the table in protest. Do you have any idea how many people we had to kill to make sure Hitler came to power? Hodge is taken aback by her statement. Wow. So your definition of a successful operation was to put one of the worst humans in history in power? In the simplest of terms, yes. With the way things were left after World War I, there was going to be another massive conflict. Our mission was to create the conditions needed to put America in a position to be a world power, which we did. Yeah, just as the expense of 40 million people. 40 million is a hell of a lot better than the billions lost as a result of the war and nuclear winter. The USA alone lost 40 million people due to starvation in the first year of the nuclear winter. God only knows how many people around the world died that year. Look, after World War I and the Treaty of Versailles there was going to be another major conflict with Germany leading the way. We did the best we could given the situation we were thrown into. There were only 18 of us, and we had a limited amount of time to accomplish a near impossible task. We settled on Hitler, because he was an incompetent leader, at least militarily. His actions led to the least destructive outcome for Europe and the world. Hodge held his hand up in an effort to get Artemis to pause. Wait, wait, I thought you had a time machine. Why wouldn't you give yourself decades to get things done? Unfortunately, that's not the way time travel works. Of course it isn't. Okay, I'll bite. Explain to me how time travel works. Very well. In 2026, an alien space probe crashed into rural Texas. Wait. Just. Wait. This story has time travel and aliens, Hodge said as he downed the last of his coffee and thrusted his cup into the air. Barkeep, can I get a refill? This feels like a two-cup kind of story. Artemis cocked her head to the side and smirked a bit mildly amused by Hodge's reaction. You good? Oh yes, where were we? Oh yeah, aliens in Texas. Please proceed. America was in rough shape by 2026. Famine and poverty were rampant and virtually identical technologically to where we were in the mid-1980s. Every bit of our limited resources went into growing food. When the probe was analyzed, there was hope within the scientific community 
that it could be used as a power supply. So a top-secret underground bunker was created for testing. The best and the brightest minds from across the country were assembled. Due to the secrecy and potential of the project, we gave up our lives on the surface and took up permanent residence in the bunker. Despite our collective brilliance, we couldn't make any headway in harnessing the power of the alien artifact. That is until January of 2031. Out of nowhere, the probe powered up, so our best tech went in to investigate. The power kept building for 20 minutes until it opened and emitted a blinding light. When we regained our eyesight, we saw that the tech had vanished. Let me guess, he went back in time. Yeah, I did. Robert said as he refilled Hodge's coffee, all the way back to 1925. 1925. Wow, you look really good for being 130 years old. Robert poured a shot of whiskey into the coffee before pouring one for himself. Thanks, I try to stay in shape. Oh man, this is fantastic stuff. So what, do you guys have some industrial strength Botox in the future? They do actually. Artemis responded in a playful tone. According to the commercials, it's fantastic stuff. They inject some into a woman's face, then bounce a quarter off of it so forcefully that it ricochets through a wall. However, that's not why we look so young. Do tell. We don't have anything scientific to back this up. But as best as we can tell, the alien probe removed us from the timeline. Hodge stared blankly for a moment before responding. What the hell does that even mean? It means that we aren't impacted by time. In other words, we don't age. So, you are immortal? No, we are still human and can be killed like any other person can. Although thanks to some future technology and medication, we are a little more resilient than your average man on the street. Hodge took a beat to contemplate pseudo-immortality before continuing. Okay, so that the near-immortal bartender got sent back to 1925. How could you possibly figure that out? Wouldn't your timeline be changed the moment he got here? It did change for everyone who wasn't in the complex. Being in close proximity to the alien probe put us in a time-protected bubble. We could see the changes happening around us, but weren't impacted by them. So what did he do? Pull a Doc Brown sent you a telegram, Hodge asked with a grin. Well, it's kind of hard for Western Union to deliver to a top-secret facility that is buried a mile underground so he had to get a little more creative. Did you ever see the 1950s monster movie Day of the Demon? Oh, yeah, I loved that when I was younger. Saw it at the drive-in on a double feature with lobster men from Mars. What can I say? My father instilled me with a profound appreciation for the classics. Good. Now take a look at Robert over there. Does he look familiar to you at all? Hodge turned and studied Robert as he wiped down the bar top. He racked his brain for a moment before it clicked. You know, now that you mention it, he does look a lot like Dr. Roth, the archaeologist that summons the demon. That's because he is. Get out! Hodge yelled, slamming his hand down on the table in excitement. I gotta tell you, Artemis, I'm thoroughly impressed with how much thought you have put into this whole performance here. But please, continue. Well, like you, I was raised with an appreciation of the classics, Day of the Demon included. The local TV station would play it every Halloween at midnight. Robert and I had an annual tradition where we would grab a six-pack and watch it. That first year without him was rough. But when Halloween rolled around, I wanted to carry on the tradition. When I tuned in that night, I almost fell out of my chair when Robert came on screen. Wait, how did he manage to take over the role? Hodge inquired. Well, when you fund the film, it makes it a lot easier to get screen time. Let me guess, he pulled a Biff Tannen. You really like your Back to the Future references, don't you? Well, it's either that or Terminator ones, which now that I think about it, kind of describes you, doesn't it? Not exactly, Artemis replied. I'm just here to make the world a better place, not save some suburban waitress so she can fulfill her destiny. Hodge nodded in agreement. Fair enough. But yes, you are correct. He did pull a Biff Tannen. Robert was a huge baseball fan, so he was able to amass quite a fortune early on. 
and he was able to use those ill-gotten gains to turn himself into a movie star. Brilliant. He thought so, Artemis said, giving Robert a thumbs up, resulting in a raised glass from him. Okay, so I get how he was able to let you know you had a time machine, but it still doesn't explain why you didn't have much time to alter the war. I mean, going back to 1925 would give you plenty of time, wouldn't it? You are correct. Going back to 1925 would have given us plenty of time. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. When activated, the alien probe sends people back exactly 106 years into the past. Because we don't have any control over it, we had to wait for the probe to power up on its own. And let me guess, it takes a while for that to happen. Five years, three weeks, six days and 14 hours to be precise. My team and I arrived in 1930, and it took us two months to get to Germany. That didn't give us a lot of time to start eliminating the people we needed to. Hodge downed the last of his coffee and wiped a drop from the corner of his mouth before continuing. You know, I have to hand it to you. That was one hell of a story. I almost started to believe that you were a part of some sort of eliminator time force that came here to save humanity. You should be proud because you were that convincing. And finding a lookalike for Dr. Roth from Day of the Demon. My God. That was priceless. But I'm afraid that my cup is empty, so it's time to go find you a nice comfy room at the asylum. Artemis leaned back in her chair with confidence. So you aren't interested in finding Anthony Duke? Oh, I'm very interested. I just don't have any confidence you can help me. It's one thing to listen to a crazy alien time travel story over a cup of coffee. It's another thing entirely to go on wild goose chases. Fair enough. So what will it take for you to believe me? You can use your crystal ball and tell me where Anthony Duke is. I wish it were that easy, but he has fallen off the grid and I can't get a solid read on his whereabouts. That's why I contacted you. I need your help. Well, that's convenient. So you have nothing then. Robert dropped a file folder in front of Hodge, setting a new cup of coffee beside it. This should do the trick, he said, before heading back to the bar. Hodge took a sip of his fresh coffee and inspected the folder. Thank you, sir. So tell me, Artemis, what do we have here? You have the information on the murder of Anna Page, who will be found dead tomorrow by a couple of hikers. So you have tomorrow's headlines, Hodge asked skeptically. Keep going, there's more. Hodge flipped through the printouts before pausing on a headline from 2025. Wow, nice Photoshop work there. You even redesigned the newspaper's logo. Not photoshopped, just printing out the real news story. Okay, let's see here. So Dan Bankston murdered Anna, along with six other women, between now and when he is caught in 2025? Yep, today is his first kill. He picks his victims from internet dating sites, focusing on the women who enjoy camping. They go out on a few dates before he gets them to go out into the wilderness with him. Once they get out to the woods, he spikes their drink before he and a couple of low-life scumbag friends rape and murder her. And what? You think these printouts prove you can see into the future? On their own? No. But when we go out to the woods and catch the trio in action, you'll know I'm legit. Hodge reached down to his waistband for a pair of handcuffs and tossed them onto the table. Give me one reason why I should go along with this, instead of arresting you right now. Well, for starters, you saw what I did to Kevin Hauser, and in the back of your mind, you know it's way too early in the morning for that kind of struggle, Artemis stated before putting her arms out wrists up. However, I'll cut you a break. Why don't you go ahead and cuff me? The woods are on the way to the asylum, so we can stop and investigate my claim. Worst case scenario, you get a little exercise. Best case, you stop an innocent woman from needlessly dying. And besides, what else do you have to do today? Hodge leaned back in his chair, contemplating the offer before downing the last of his java. Oh, what the hell, he stated, slamming the cup onto the table and grabbing the cuffs. I could probably use some time to recover from this coffee before heading into the office anyway. Great stuff, by the way, Robert. I aim to please. Artemis stood patiently with her arms stretched out in front of her while Hodge affixed the cuffs. 
Once she was secure, Hodge motioned towards the door. After you, ma'am. Such a gentleman. We'll be back in a bit, Robert. You two kids have fun. Chapter 6. Despite being one of the fastest growing metro areas in the country, Austin, Texas has easy access to a wide variety of hiking trails and camping sites. Properly groomed and well-maintained, these trails are visited by hundreds of thousands of people every single year and are one of the big draws to the city. Unfortunately for Artemis and Hodge, Mr. Bankston picked a camping site far off the beaten path. Okay, you have another half mile. And then we are turning back Hodge wheezed, struggling to catch his breath. You know, Hodge, I would have thought a special agent who spent his days chasing down the baddest of the bad would be in better shape. Yeah, well, lucky for me, tracking down murderers and robbers is mostly research. I'm at a point in my career where I can delegate the actual chasing of bad guys. Don't worry. It should just be up ahead here. The two of them approached a clearing, kneeling down about 50 yards short behind a downed tree. Hodge pulled out a pair of mini binoculars to investigate the scene. He was not surprised to find a modest campsite populated by two young people. Well, I'll be damned, Hodge said as he sat down beside Artemis. There they are. A nice, happy couple outside enjoying nature for some reason. Not a fan of the woods, I take it? Nope. I just never understood the appeal of shunning thousands of years of progress. Give me cold beer and indoor plumbing any day. Nothing wrong with that, Artemis replied. You should have seen the conditions I had to grow up in before moving to the secret facility. It's a wonder I ever go outside these days. Okay, so now what? Hodge inquired as he peered through the binoculars again, watching the couple engaging in conversation. I don't see anything particularly bad going on, outside of their drink choice. Man, life is just too short to waste it on cheap alcohol. It shouldn't be long. Dan's M.O. was to pre-spike the beer and put a fresh cap back on the bottle so his victim wouldn't be suspicious. By the time she gets halfway through, the poor girl is going to be borderline comatose. The two sat in silence for a moment, waiting for the inedible. Can I ask you a question? Hodge inquired. Sure. Why me? What do you mean? Artemis asked as she stretched out on the ground, using a downed tree as a makeshift headrest. I mean, why of all the law enforcement people in this town did you approach me? Because you were simultaneously stubborn yet open-minded. Hodge took a moment and attempted to comprehend her answer. That literally makes no sense. Sure it does. I read up on your pursuit of Duke. Took you ten years to track him down, but you never gave up. You didn't care about accolades or promotions. Your only desire was to see him behind bars. You never dismissed any potential lead, even if it came from a prostitute, drug dealer, or even a psychic. Wait. Wait, Hodge said, shaking his head in the process. When did I consult a psychic? Two years from now. She approached you claiming to know where one of Duke's victims is buried. Everyone else in the department laughed in her face, but you took the time to listen to her. You even went so far as to follow the lead she gave. Ultimately, there wasn't anything there. But that didn't matter. You were willing to believe someone most would deem insane, just on the off chance they were right. Gave me hope that you would believe me. Hodge nodded in agreement. Well, you aren't wrong. I mean, I'm in the middle of the woods spying on a couple of sex-crazed teenagers through binoculars, like a common perv because I think it might lead me to Duke. But how would you have known about that? Somehow I doubt that would have made the news. When you finally caught Anthony Duke, you got an enormous amount of press. You do a lot of interviews that delve into your career, the case, and even your past. How do you think I found out about Francis? Oh, Lord. Please don't call me that. Why not? I think it's a testament to just how much your mother loved you. Hell, it's a wonder she didn't pack you up and run. Yeah, I'd like to think naming a son Francis would be sufficient grounds for divorce. Hodge chuckled. Hey, heads up, I think we got something. The two of them watched as Dan and Anna drank their beers. Anna became woozy, dropping her beer on the ground and slumping over in a heap. Dan took another long drink before whistling loudly, signaling two others who emerged from the tree line. 
Well, what do you know? Looks like you were right, Artemis. It's almost like I can see into the future or something, she replied playfully, resulting in a displeased glare from Hodge. We aren't quite there yet. Yeah, but we are getting closer. Why don't you go ahead and uncuff me and I'll go rescue her? Why? I can handle them, Hodge stated. Because you are starting to think I'm telling the truth. And besides, after seeing what I did to Kevin Hauser, you really want to see what I can do in a fight. Hodge contemplated for a moment before shrugging his shoulders in agreement. What the hell? You have a point. Okay, give me your hands. The silver cuffs detached. Freeing Artemis's hands. She stretched her arms out wide and cracked her neck to the side. Okay, that's better. You wait here. I'm going to go disarm them. Hodge grabbed her arm as she began to walk away. Hold up, he said, pulling a knife from his pocket and extending it to her. You are going to need something to defend yourself with. Artemis pulled out what appeared to be a normal blue LED laser pointer and held it up. Nah, it's all good. I got it covered, she replied, giving Hodge a wink and a smile in the process. Hodge was paralyzed with confusion as he watched her walk into battle. Dan and his two friends, George and Terry, hovered around the heavily sedated Anna, like they were vultures about to feast on their prey. The three of them looked like they would be right at home at a college bar, with their tight-fitting t-shirts exposing their well-developed physique and their hair containing enough gel to fill a kiddie pool. I gotta take a piss, Dan said. Then we're gonna show this bitch a good time. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah we are. The two exclaimed while giving each other a high five like obnoxious frat boys after a meaningless achievement. Artemis quietly approached the duo from behind, after Dan was out of earshot. She stopped about ten feet away, standing with her arms resting behind her back. A moment passed before she let out a slight whistle to get their attention. Hey, boys, she said seductively. Damn, baby, how you doing? George sleazily inquired as they turned toward her. Yeah, you looking for a little fun, Terry added. Well, you could say that. But I don't know if the two of you can handle me, though. Don't worry, sweetheart. We're more than enough man for you, George replied as the two of them flexed in an attempt to look macho. Well... You say that, Artemis said in a sly tone. But aren't you just waiting in line for sloppy seconds on that poor passed out girl there? Terry and George stopped flexing and went into a more defensive stance. I mean, seriously, do you have to knock a girl out just so she won't laugh at your tiny dicks? The two of them become enraged. Bitch, I'm gonna knock you the fuck out and then we're gonna have our fun with you before slitting your throat. Terry impotently raged. Artemis struggled to contain her laughter. I tell you what, tiny dick. If you succeed, then you too can have your way with me. I mean, I'm not really concerned given that I wouldn't feel anything anyway. Dinner! George yelled, shoving his partner in her direction. Terry ran full steam towards Artemis, who remained in her casual pose. He led with his right fist in an attempt to knock her out with a single blow. She deftly countered the punch by stepping slightly to the left, throwing her right arm around the back of his head and using his momentum to drive his face directly into the ground. Despite being a considerable distance away, Hodge could hear Terry's nose cracking on the ground. Terry writhed on the ground in pain, but Artemis wasn't finished with him yet. She pulled out the laser pointer and jammed it into his arm, pressing the top trigger as it touched his skin, eliciting only a thunking sound from the gadget. George went on the attack, moving with purpose towards Artemis, who had just regained her footing. He tried to land a couple of haymakers, but drew nothing but air as she dodged them with ease. What's wrong, bud? Having some performance issues, Artemis taunted as she took a looser fighting stance. George was not amused by her attitude. He let out a primal scream and put his full weight into the next punch. Artemis fell back to avoid the blow while kicking her leg straight out landing a direct shot on his knee and sending him staggering back and into a kneeling position. Artemis popped up off the ground quickly, leaped into the air and landed on his collarbones with her knees, driving him into the ground and cracking the bone. She deftly rolled off and hopped up before casually taking her time to walk back to him. No wonder you have to drug your women, she said mockingly. 
George tried to ignore the pain and reach up to grab her. Artemis pulled out the laser pointer and repeated the thunking process on him, with the two frat boys indisposed. Artemis took a few steps towards Anna. Just as she got close, Dan emerged from the woods. All right, boys, let's do this, he said, just before seeing them on the ground. What the fu? He tried to exclaim before Artemis got the jump on him. She drove her foot into the side of his knee, rendering the leg useless. The only reason he didn't hit the ground was because Artemis grabbed his shirt collar and drove the laser pointer into the back of his skull. Thunk was all he heard before feeling a slight pinch. Artemis walked in front of Dan and looked him right in the eyes before rearing back and planting her foot into the center of his face. Hodge watched in amazement from the edge of the campsite as Artemis casually walked over to him. Terry and George were slowly pulling themselves off the ground and making their way over to Dan's side. When Artemis got close, they drugged themselves out of her path, fearful of what she would do to them. You all right? Hodge inquired as he pulled his gun from his holster. Yeah, just fine. Feels good to get a workout in, she replied as she walked up beside him. Well, maybe next time, instead of counting how many calories you're burning, you should try focusing on your task. My task? Hodge motioned towards the trio and aimed his gun towards them. They have gotten to their feet, and Dan is holding a gun he pulled from his tent. The three of them are bloodied and angry about it. Yeah, your task. You said you were going to disarm them, and you obviously didn't. Oh yeah, my bad Artemis stated before pulling out the laser pointer. She flicked a switch on the side of it before clicking the top button twice. Within seconds... Both Terry and George are on their knees, screaming in agony. The injection site on their arms begins to glow a bright red, causing the surrounding flesh to begin to bubble up and melt off their bones. This process rapidly expands outwards from the injection site, their screams becoming more deafening as blood blisters form on the skin and explode, revealing the muscle and bone beneath. With each pop, the life drains from their body, their screams becoming quieter. Dan watched in horror as his two friends collapse onto the ground beside him, their arms reduced to blood-covered bone. His hands shook violently as he struggled to comprehend what he just saw. Hodge was equally mystified at what he just witnessed. What the fuck was that? Well, I said I was going to disarm them, Artemis replied slyly. Hodge dropped his gun slightly and gave her an are-you-for-real look. We really need to work on our communication skills. Well, now you know that I'm a very direct person. And I mean what I say. Yeah, no shit. Ah, uh, um, I'm gonna kill you motherfuckers. Dan yelled in a panicked tone. I'm going to kill both of you right here. And then I'm going to find your families and... Artemis flicked another button on the side and gave the laser pointer one more click. Dan immediately stopped talking. His eyes bugged out and started to bleed. He let out a yell before his head exploded like it took a 12-gauge shell at point-blank range. His headless corpse collapsed to the ground. Uh, that's better, Artemis said as she stretched her arms out. Wow, you can even hear the birds singing. Hodge slowly holstered his weapon while shaking his head in disbelief. Don't you think that was a little extreme? They were going to rape and murder an unconscious woman then do it several more times. So no, I don't think that was too extreme. Point taken, Hodge said, shrugging his shoulders in agreement. So how do we clean up this mess? We don't. What do you mean we don't? There are three dead guys in the middle of the woods. I'm pretty sure there's going to be an investigation. I have no doubt, but it isn't going to go anywhere. The technology doesn't exist to trace my weapon. So we are in the clear, Artemis said, waving her magical death-dealing laser pointer in the air. Speaking of that, where in the hell did you get a laser pointer that melts limbs and explodes heads? Oh, this! Came in the last shipment. Shipment? Has the sharper image gone hardcore? Hodge jokingly inquired. It's from my annual shipment. From the future. Future shipment. So your friends in the future are sending you murderous cat toys. What else do they send you? You can see for yourself if you like. The next shipment is due in about eight hours. 
Wow, that's convenient, Hodge mockingly replied. Robert and I discussed it, and we thought that if saving Anna from certain death wasn't enough to convince you I was telling the truth, that seeing a crate of future technology appearing before your eyes would do it. Well, let's just say I'm starting to believe. But if you can David Copperfield some future tech that should win me over. So where do we need to go? There's a warehouse about an hour outside of Austin. But we need to go ahead and take off because we need to stop by the office first. Artemis said as she started to walk off. Wait a second. What about her? Artemis paused for a moment. What about her? We can't just leave her here, Hodge stammered. Won't waking up to this mess traumatize her? Maybe. At the very least, she'll probably swear off internet dating. Artemis said, cracking a sly smile in the process. I tell you what, if she isn't fine, we'll come back. How the hell are we going to know that? Let's go to the office and I'll show you. Chapter 7 The door to the office cracked open, bathing the cluttered room in light. Artemis flipped on the overhead light, revealing the full extent of the room. Whoa, Hodge exclaimed. Yeah, I know. It makes me look like I'm some sort of conspiracy theorist, doesn't it? Just a bit, but I like it. Reminds me of my first office when I started this job. Artemis walked over to the wall beside her desk and grabbed a marker, drawing a line through Dan's name and adding seven to the save board. Hodge leaned in for a closer look. So, what are these boards? Well, the top one is my most wanted list. And as you can tell, I've made some progress. The other board is the number of people I've saved. Wow! Over 16,000 people saved. That's quite an impressive number. How many people have you had to kill to reach that? Hodge asked. I imagine it is pretty high. But I stopped counting when I got to 500. Oh yeah, when was that? 1972. The look on Hodge's face was a mixture of horror and impressed. Not just because of how prolific Artemis had been over the years, but how she hasn't shown up on anyone's radar. Artemis booted up her laptop, drawing an amused look from Hodge. Wow. And I thought I was behind the times. Looks like that was cutting edge back in 2002, he mockingly said. She spun her office chair around and shot him a disapproving look. Didn't your mother ever teach you that it's what is on the inside that counts? No. She figured she had done enough for me by getting me named something other than Francis. Hodge deadpanned. I tend to agree with her on that, actually. So why are you using such an ancient piece of technology? I was expecting holograms and other fancy stuff. Only the case is ancient. Most of the inner components won't be invented for another decade or two. Hodge still looked perplexed. Okay, I still don't understand. Well, Hodge, if you had a machine that could see into the future, would you want it to be nice and shiny, or would you want it to look like a worthless piece of junk? That makes sense. Just hide it in plain sight. I mean, if I were a robber, I wouldn't give that thing a second look. Now you're catching on, Artemis mockingly said. So, how does that thing work exactly? He inquired, leaning in for a closer look. Well, I can give you a lot of technical mumbo-jumbo. Hodge rubbed his temple with his hand as he responded, as if to preempt a migraine. Please don't. For lack of a better term, this computer has a direct link to a computer in the future. Wait, I thought you said the probe thingy only activated every five years or so. It does, but it constantly generates a small temporal rift. So while it isn't anywhere near large enough to send a person through, it's plenty big for small bits of data, Artemis said. So you can get news articles and stuff like that? Artemis playfully smacked Hodge on the arm. Exactly. When they do send the shipment, they include hard drives that has a snapshot of the internet. Every photo, website, video, etc. All in one tidy package. Hodge looked impressed before coming up with a concern. But wait. Doesn't that get out of date pretty quickly? Given how you are out there changing the future by taking our killers and all? Artemis nodded in agreement. On an individual level, it can get out of date almost immediately. However, if you are trying to stop a terrorist attack, it helps a great deal to have multiple documentaries breaking down every single thing that happened. Talk about having the tactical advantage. You ain't kidding. 
So why can't you look up Duke on that thing? Hodge asked. All I have on him at the moment is out-of-date information from the last shipment. His timeline diverted off course about six months ago. What do you mean? Well, I was tracking him and comparing his actions to what was on the shipment drive. And they synced up perfectly. So why didn't you get him? Shouldn't he have been a priority? Well, he was on my list. And I was working my way towards him. I finally had an opportunity to nab him six months ago. But he didn't show up to take out his intended victim. So who did he kill instead? Artemis pointed to the president's board. Number 49. Hodge looked at the board and couldn't make sense of it. So, they have their own board. Do I want to know who they were? Those are, or were, the future presidents of this country. Hodge's knees buckled a bit, forcing him to sit on the edge of the desk. Duke is killing future presidents. Why? No. Wait. The better question is how. The only theory I have at the moment is that one of my former team members is trying to change the future and is using Duke as the muscle. Even if that is the case, shouldn't he still show up on your crystal ball computer there? I thought you got constant updates. Well, Artemis said, pausing for dramatic effect. It's complicated. Hodge shook his head in a defeated manner. Well, I wouldn't expect anything less from you at this point. Okay, explain it to me. If he is working closely with someone from my team, then there's a good chance his future is tethered to theirs and hidden from me. Why do I get the sense I'm going to need ibuprofen for this? Artemis didn't miss a beat, reaching over to the desk and tossing a bottle of pills to Hodge. He caught them and toasted the bottle as if to say thanks. As I told you back at the bar, we exist outside the timeline, which means we don't show up anywhere unless we specifically act. For example, if I did a search for my future self, it would come up empty unless I did something massive. But don't you do massive things every day? I mean, you just killed three guys. There are seven and a half billion people on the planet. Three people isn't even a rounding error. Artemis stated, okay, think of it like this. Picture time, like a raging river flowing free. What I did today was like throwing a pebble into it, just a small splash that is immediately forgotten. In order to show up, I would have to drop a raider-sized boulder into it. So what would qualify as a raider-sized boulder? Hodge inquired, amused by the reference to one of his favorite films. Oh, you know, the usual. Blowing up a city, releasing a plague that wipes out half the planet, win a televised singing contest, and becoming known the world over. So if Duke is doing the bidding and under the direction of someone like you, he would vanish from your future machine. Exactly. Which is why I need your help. You've been tracking him for years, so you might have insights that I wouldn't. It's one thing to read some articles online. It's another thing to eat sleep and breathe this case. You'd be right. But it's still a tough hill to climb and not at all depressing to think about a mass murderer who can see the future. Holy fuck. Hodge paused to let the grim reality set it. So do you have any good news? Artemis spun around in her chair and typed on the computer for a moment, before leaning back so Hodge could see. Okay, here you go. Some good news. The future of Anna Page. Hodge leaned over her shoulder and saw an obituary from 2070. It was a lengthy piece, documenting the life and times of Anna. Huh. Look at that. Anna Page, 91. Survived by her husband. Four children. Seven grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. Hodge stepped back from the computer and retook his seat on the edge of the table. Wow. So 14 people will come into existence because of what we did today? Yep. It's success stories like this that help me get past the knowledge that I destroy just as many lives simply by existing, Artemis said in a subdued tone. What do you mean? How do you destroy lives? I mean, besides the ones you explode. I don't belong in this timeline, so something as simple as getting a cup of coffee or going to the movies can alter the future and wipe people from existence. Oh, come on, Hodge dismissively retorted. Don't get all overdramatic on me now. It's true. How many times have you heard someone say that their big break in life, 
was because they were in the right place at the right time. Hell, just look at your own life. Artemis stated with authority. Hodge was taken aback. Wait, what about my life? Think about when you met your wife. You were both in Dallas at a conference and staying at the same hotel. You woke up early your last day there, went down to the lobby, got a cup of coffee, then made your way to the taxis. You and your future wife grabbed the door handle at the same moment. You both laughed before sharing the cab. Your stop was first, some greasy spoon breakfast joint you saw on one of the food channels. The two of you had such a great time chatting in the cab she joined you for breakfast. Before parting ways, you exchanged numbers and made dinner plans for when you were both back in town. Since fate was on your side and you both lived in Austin. A year later, you were engaged and expecting the first of your two children. Hodge was stunned into silence at the wealth of personal information Artemis had on him. It was one thing to know about Francis, but this was something else. Holy hell, did you get all of that from your future telling machine there? No. You just overshared during your anniversary post on social media. You're in law enforcement. You should have that shit on lockdown. Oh. Hodge responded, struggling to find anything more than a single syllable to express his embarrassment. Now, imagine if I were staying at that hotel and I got my coffee the same time you did. Instead of three people in front of you, there would be four. It's not something you would notice or particularly care about but it would delay your schedule by about two minutes. Hodge began to put two and two together as she spoke. If you get to the taxis two minutes later, you don't meet your wife. Without that meeting, your two children aren't born. Your future grandkids are never born. When you and your wife marry other people, the children that would have resulted from your partner's other relationships are never born. Even if we stop there, that's what? 10. 12 people who were wiped from existence. All because I got coffee in the morning. Yeah, but other lives take their place. It's not like you are willingly taking innocent lives out. I know, but it doesn't matter. Artemis said in a dejected tone, using this computer, I can look up anyone and see the entirety of their lives. They exist right now. They may not have been born yet, but I can see the entirety of their lives. They have family, friends, jobs. Some of them do extraordinary things. About 40 years ago, I saw a documentary about Josie Chambers. And in 2014, she became the youngest woman to win a Nobel Prize in physics. She made some breakthrough that was far too technical, even for me to fully grasp. But it revolutionized the field. And she was heralded as one of the brightest minds of her time. So what happened? Artemis took a serious tone. I was on the job in Chicago, and it was a rough one. There was a serial killer that was targeting nurses when they got off their shift. And by the end of his reign, he claimed 18 lives. I got to the scene late, and ain't he had a woman sliced open. I saw him there covered in her blood, grinning like a madman, and it sent me into a rage. Normally, I kill using technology so I don't risk detection but I beat this guy with my bare hands. Beat him so badly that he was unrecognizable. Needless to say, I needed to cool off. So after getting cleaned up, I hit the hotel bar. About four drinks and a young man bought me a drink and we got to chatting. Nothing sleazy happened, mind you, but we ended up talking till closing. We parted ways and I went back to my room to pass out. About a week later when I was back home, I decided to look up Josie to see what else she did, and I couldn't find anything. Turned out that the man I was having drinks with that night was friends with her future mother. He got into an accident on the drive home and ended up in the hospital for several weeks. He didn't have any family in the area, so Josie's future mom took care of him and in the process fell for him. So because I had a drink with someone, one of the brightest minds in the history of the world ceased to exist. Knowledge like that can wear on you. I, I can't imagine Artemis, Hodge said in a comforting tone. That must be really difficult for you. And well, your entire team. I think I'm the last one who cares, actually, she replied, snapping out of her serious mode. Once we put the country on the right path, most of the surviving team retired. 
They just wanted to get out of history's way as best they could and enjoy the new future we had created for the country. In fact, the only other active meddler I know is Brent. Does he hunt bad guys like you? No. Actors, Artemis said with a chuckle. Actors? Why in the world would he do that? Well, he's a big TV and movie guy. Has an incredible home theater system. 125-inch projection screen with surround sound. Even sprung for the professional 3D glasses. Whenever I'm done copying over the information I need from the shipment, I send him the drive with all the entertainment. So, in essence, you send him future Netflix, Hodge inquired. Something like that. An entire century's worth of movies and TV shows. Every now and then, an actor will get cast in a role he loves, and they ruin it. When that happens, Brent will intervene. So a better actor gets the role. My God, that's terrible, Hodge exclaimed. He kills people if he doesn't like their acting. No. Well, okay, rarely. Usually, he just sabotages their career or does something that keeps them from a role. Like what? So Brent is a huge Marvel fan, especially the X-Men and Wolverine in particular. For years, he ranted about how they miscast Wolverine with Doug Ray Scott and wanted to get him out of the role. He enjoyed his work and didn't want to destroy his career. So he devised a plan. Brent went to where they were shooting Mission Impossible 2, which was his project before joining the X-Men, and he caused all sorts of problems and delays with the production. Nothing major, just convincing a few key people to leave the shoot, as well as a few other minor shenanigans. The shoot went over schedule, Scott had to drop out, and Hugh Jackman became one of the biggest stars in the world, and I never had to hear about how the role was miscast from Brent again. Wow, that's a hell of a story. I don't think it's right, but still, you have to admire the dedication. After what he went through in the war, I figure he's earned the right, Artemis said while trying to hide the memory of his ordeal from her face. What did he go through in the war? It's a long story, but the nickel version is that we were in Germany, and he's Jewish, she replied, noticing Hodge's shocked look. It took us weeks to track him down, and we lost a couple of team members liberating him. Between the experience and the guilt of his friends losing their life because of him, he just shut down. That's harsh. You're right. He's earned the right. Just try to keep his murdering to a minimum, unless the actor is really terrible, Hodge said in a lighthearted tone. Artemis noticed the clock on the wall and shut the laptop lid. We need to get going, Hodge. It's a bit of a drive to the warehouse to get the shipment. And it's almost time. All right, let's do it. This is the end of Eliminator Time Force Part 1. Tune in next time to see if Artemis and Hodge can succeed in their mission of tracking down the villainous Anthony Duke and his mysterious partner.